one of the stages we all go through, or at least most of us go through as we grow up, is the why phase, where we answer everything with a why. It's certainly a, a very frustrating time as a parent when your kid goes through this, uh, when you know you say, hey, let's wash up, let's go potty, let's brush our teeth, let's go to school, whatnot. And, uh, and the child responds with, why? Why? Um, usually this takes place around, you know, toddler years, you know, two or three years old. And uh, there's a very funny uh, cartoon kind of taking, making fun of this uh, as part of uh, the Animaniacs. Uh, cartoon. If you haven't watched any of that, I know it's uh, <laughs> kind of uh, beyond a lot of you. It's uh, kind of too old for a lot of you, too ancient. Um, but there are some episodes on YouTube. Uh, it's It was good stuff uh, back when I was in high school. Uh, yeah, okay, now I feel old. <laughs> um, but one of, the, one of the characters they had on Animaniacs was a little girl named Mindy. She had a dog named Buttons, and she would always ask why of her mom. That's pretty much, you know, most of her lines for the whole uh, show was why. So her mom would be like, you have to go out, and then why? And then she just respond why to everything until she just gets bored and says, okay, I love you, bye-bye. Uh, you know, it's a little cute cute watching, uh, you know, watching someone else go through it. Um, but we all go through this uh, and it's part of a healthy development because, uh, you know, we're, we're curious about how the world works and, and why, why we do the things that we do. Uh, it's, it's healthy in a way if you actually want to find out the answers. There's, there's another TV show. I didn't really watch it uh, I never really watched through a whole episode, but I did watch some clips while I was flipping through channels. Uh, it was Malcolm in the Middle. And then one time I just happened to catch a little clip as I was scrolling through channels. Uh, and one of Malcolm's older brothers had joined the army. And and his senior officer was so happy about, about this boy joining the army because he never asked questions he just did exactly as he was told. And so he was told to like, you know, walk into a wall and you just keep on walking to a wall until he was told otherwise. And the commanding officer was like, yes, finally, this is wonderful. Someone who doesn't ask why, who just takes commands and just does it. You know, it's, it's humorous because that's not what we do. That's not how we live. Uh, we don't just mindlessly obey things. We're not robots. In... In the psalm that we're talking about this morning, that we're looking at, which is Psalm 95. Psalm 95 talks about worship, but not in a way that just says, here's how to do worship, here's, you know, here's what you should be doing. But wonderfully, it also tells us the why. All right, so worship is not to be a mindless thing. It's not to be just, you know, chant this, sing this, uh, but there are reasons and rationales behind what we're told to do. So let me read Psalm 95, and then we'll pray for God's uh, guidance and leading and uh, teaching as we unpack it a little bit. So Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving, let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as, it, as at Meribah, as on the day of Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test 
and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask for you to speak a mighty word through Psalm 95 this morning. Lord, that you would teach us how to worship and why we should worship. Uh, that our worship may be full and pleasing to you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, worship is you know, such a, an important topic for us as believers. For it constitutes a great proportion of what we are called to do as Christians. I say called because this psalm uses this language. This is a call to worship. Twice it starts, O oh, come. It is an invitation to come and worship. Now worship looks kind of different now than it did maybe a year and a half ago when we worshiped all together in, in the church building. And hopefully we'll get back to some, somewhat looking like that uh, very soon. But there are some things that worship should always consist of. You know, maybe our worship has changed so that we are no longer in a church building, we're at home. We're in front of a computer, we're in front of a phone, we're in front of a TV, whatnot. And here I am, instead of preaching to you, uh, you know, face to face, uh, here I am staring at a camera lens. Uh, not the same. <laughs> not the same by a long shot. But there are some elements in the worship that have to remain the same. There are some elements that we cannot do without. And here we're going to have, in Psalm 95, we're going to talk about three different aspects of worship that we need. Uh, actually, it's, it's kind of just two aspects, but um, they're, they're kind of important, so I just broke it up into a further three. The, the third one is kind of a corollary of the second, uh, because you can see there's two O comes, there's two calls, and so there's two main sections of, of worship. But the second has implications that are far beyond um, just the come and worship. Okay, so let's look at the first one. The first, O come. That's in verse 1. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Okay, so the first element of worship that we need is singing. Worship must consist of song and, and not just song he he elaborates what this means a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation let us come into his presence with thanksgiving let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise our worship must consist of singing uh, this is probably the first thing that we think of when we think of worship. We think of the actual music. We, sing, we think of the singing part of it. And, and this is what he lists first, because worship does involve singing. It does involve music. Even though it might involve a lot more, that does not mean it does not include music. It does, and music is a large part of it. But... You know, kind of during our time of quarantine, during our time of pandemic, singing, I think, is one of the things that have taken a big hit. Why? Because it's just harder to sing to a camera, to a, a computer screen, to a TV by yourself in your room. It feels awkward. It feels strange. It feels unnatural. It feels embarrassing, especially if there's other people around you that aren't on in the worship and and they're just hearing you sing uh to a computer it, it's awkward it's weird i i understand this but god's word says when we are called to worship when we are invited to worship by god 
Worship involves singing. So first of all, let's look at kind of what the singing involves. It involves joy. Singing is a method to release, to express our joy, to express what we are feeling on the inside. Singing engages not only our mind, because we have to think of the lyrics, but it also engages our emotions. It engages our heart. It engages our innermost being. And so God calls us to engage in singing because that engages our joy, that engages our thankfulness, that engages our brain, our heart, our emotions, our feelings, all that comes out when we sing. And now I'm not just saying, I'm not just talking about listening to the music. I'm talking about actually singing. There's something that happens when you actually open your mouth and you sing it. It's very different from, you know, singing the words in your head or mouthing the words or just reading the words. Very different. And I don't know what it is. I don't know the scientific processes or the psychological principles behind it. But when we engage our mouth and we actually sing, it feels so much different. It feels so much deeper. And, and as a musician, I felt this. You know, there are times when, you know, we're worshiping to a computer and, you know, again, since it's weird and awkward, I don't feel like singing. <laughs> Especially like if I'm in a meeting and then the rest of my family is doing something else, it, it's weird to sing. But it's not the same if, if I just sing it in my head or read along with the lyrics uh, than if I actually belt out the song. I feel that when I don't actually sing, I'm not engaging my emotions. I'm not engaging my heart. I'm only engaging my brain. And when you only engage your brain, uh, you don't engage your joy. You might engage some of your thankfulness, but you don't enjoy your, you don't engage your joy. You don't engage your emotions. And so we are called to sing. And, and I encourage you guys, as you are sitting at home in front of your TV screen, computer screen, smartphone, when we have worship uh, on Sunday morning, I encourage you to sing. Even though it feels awkward, even though it feels weird, I encourage you to sing uh, because it engages you in a way that just reading the lyrics or just listening to the music does not do. Okay, uh, but let's look at Psalm 95 and it tells us why we are to sing praises. There is a reason, uh, not just you know that it engages our joy, our thankfulness, our emotions, but its foundation is in fact, not us. Now, a lot of the things I, I mentioned about why we should sing is kind of selfish. That it engages our emotions and engages my emotions. And so when I sing worship, I get a lot more out of it. I feel the presence of God closer. I feel the worship. I feel the presence of God. But yet, Psalm 95 gives a reason for the singing, and that reason is not in ourselves. Let's look at what the reason is. Verse 3. For, that's because, the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also, the sea is his, for he made it in his hands form the dry land. Now, that's an interesting reason. We are to sing not for an emotional high, although it's there, but we are to sing because of who God is, because God is worthy of those praises being sung out loud. Right? He's worthy of the praises that go through our brains as we think of the lyrics, 
as we maybe read the lyrics on the screen, but he's worthy of those words being expressed in song, out loud. He's worthy of that kind of praise. He is the great God. Who is this God we're worshiping? He is the great God. He is the great king above all gods. He created everything. He created the depths of the earth, the mountains, the skies, the deeps, everything. He formed it. And because he is that great and awesome, the psalmist calls us to worship calls us to express our worship in song. And, and maybe this speaks to if, if when you sing, you know, and if you actually do sing out loud, maybe you don't feel that joy, maybe you don't feel that thankfulness. Well, part of it is because maybe, um, you know, you're not rooting yourself in who God is. That we got to be in God's word and we got to be knowing deep in our souls who this God is. That he's not just, you know, out there. He's not just an impersonal spirit. He's not just, you know, a God among many. He's not just one choice among many. He's not just one path up the mountain. He's not just one spoke on the wheel. God is all. He is the only God, and there is no other. There is no rival. There is no one more glorious. There is no one that even makes a close second to God the Almighty. And so because of his, his awesomeness, because of his worthiness, we are called to express our joy and our thanksgiving in song. Okay, so that's the first point. How are we to worship God? With singing. Why? Because God is a great God. Second, uh, verse 6. The next, O come. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Now, we're not really that familiar with this kind of worship. Because this, this word, these words here, he uses three separate words, but they all in the Hebrew have a very similar meaning. So if you want to, to translate it badly, not inaccurately, but just kind of how to translate it in a way that doesn't sound very good. You could translate this. O come, let us bow down and bow down. Let us bow down before the Lord, our maker. Horrible poetry, <laughs> but it really emphasizes the point that the word worship in the Old Testament and the New Testament, at least one of the one of the main words for worship, means to bow down. It means to kneel before God. That is, we express our humility before God. We express our subordination before God. We express our lowliness before God. We express our place in worship is on our knees. This is very foreign to us because when we worship, our posture is we either stand up or we sit down. Those are the two main postures in Western worship and how we experience the worship of God in church. We stand up, we bow down. I mean, we stand up or we sit down. You know, sitting down is because the very relaxed meditative worship and stand up is the kind of uh, assertive, uh, joyful worship or the loud worship, so to speak. But in the Bible, worship as a posture is a posturing of bowing and kneeling. Now, postures mean things. 
right? They, they have meaning. When we worship and we just sit, it's a very relaxed, very passive worship. We are not actively engaging. Sitting in worship is very uh, uh, spectator. It's, you're, you're watching a performance. You're watching a YouTube video. You're watching something happening. But worship is not spectating. Worship is you know, involving your whole body. It's involving your, your mind. It's involving your heart. It's involving your emotions. It's involving your intellect. All of it should be engaged in worship. And so we are told to bow down. That our posture in worship is one to be uh, lowly, humble before God. Why is this? Why do we need to bow down before God? The reason is given in 7 and... Uh, 7, sorry. Uh, actually, 8 and 7. Why are we to bow down? Because the Lord is our maker. He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the sheep of His hand. Now notice the emphasis there. The emphasis is very different from the first section. The first section is we're to sing uh, not because of us, but because of God. God, you are great. God, you are awesome. God, you created all things. God, you have no rival. Here, you are to bow down. Why are we to bow down? Because God is our king. God is our maker. He is our God. We are the people of his pasture. We are the sheep of his hand. We are to bow down because there's a relatedness that God is not just God who is wonderful out there, but God is wonderful in relationship to us. And that is why God can say, or at least the psalmist can say in Psalm 95, come, come. It's an invitation from God. We know this is scripture, so it's inspired by God. God is speaking to us through the words of the Psalms and calling us to come. And I don't know if you've ever been struck by that, that phrase, call or come, worship. But it in fact has great significance. And the Old Testament peoples would have recognized it probably better than we would. Because to come into the presence of God took a lot of preparation. It took a lot of preparation. Why? Because we're sinful. And so for the people to draw near to God, you remember when we were in Exodus, we talked about all the purifications, we talked about all the sacrifices, we talked about all the ceremonial washings, you had to go through all of that and to present your offering to God and to be accepted so that you could draw near. Why? Because of Genesis 3. Because of the fall. Because of mankind's sin. The last word that we have in the story of the fall is God says, get out. Adam and Eve are cast out from the garden. They can't enjoy the presence of God anymore. They can't enjoy the blessings of God anymore. They have to go. God says, go. That is the result of our sin. That's the result of our wickedness. So for God to be able to say, come, means there has been a way provided by God to make up for our sins. And the Old Testament people knew this because they always had to come with blood. They had to come with a sacrifice. They had to come with an animal. And that animal had to pay the price for my sin. Had to pay the price for my guilt so that I could come to God. I could come in worship. And if you were here for the Leviticus sermons, if not, you can look for them online on our website. Uh, but we... We went through the, the fact that they, they came to worship 
and they knew that God would accept the animal sacrifice on their behalf. Right? It's not that the animal is equal to them, uh, but that in faith, God accepted the animal's life on behalf of the life of the worshiper. And how do we know that it's not an equal trade? Because the worshiper needs to bring an animal every single time he comes. That animal was only good for that one time, for that one worship service. And then the next time he wants to come close, he needs to bring another one. So when God says, come, his people are grateful. His people bow down because they realize that coming to him in worship is not a place where they can normally go. It's not a place where they deserve to be. That it's a place that can be found and that can be achieved only because God accepts an offering on the worshiper's behalf. Of course, we do not enter into worship with the blood of animals. We don't kill anything. Blood doesn't go everywhere. We don't have an altar. We don't have a fire when we worship. We worship. We are called to worship because God has sent his son. And the Old Testament points forward to this. And he accepts those animal sacrifices in faith, looking to Jesus, who will be the perfect sacrifice. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus is given as a sacrifice, as a sin offering, and he allows us to come and worship. He allows us, he, he makes the way for us to come and worship. And so when we come to this and when we, when we are invited to worship, we bow down, we are humbled. Because we know when God calls us to come, he can only do so because it cost him the life of his son. And so we come in humility. We don't come with, you know, chins lifted high, noses to the sky, because this is where we should be. No, the presence of God for sinful man is the last place he belongs. But yet, with the sacrifice of Jesus, God invites us and calls us to come and worship because we are his own. So that's the second thing. First thing, sing. How are we to worship? We are to sing because God is great. Second thing, we are to bow down because we are his. And he has made that possible. The third thing, it's kind of in the last, uh, last section of, the last part of verse 7. Uh, as you can notice, the verses are not really divided very well here. Um, these, these verses were not in the original uh, Hebrew manuscripts. These were added by monks much later. And so some of these verses are divided well and some of them are not. And so verse seven is one of those ones that are not. Um, so second part of, of verse seven, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day of Massah in the wilderness. So the second, the third thing, the third thing is to hear, to hear his voice. Worship involves singing, worship involves bowing down, and worship involves hearing God's voice. We are to hear his voice, and this is a corollary to the bowing down, right? That's why it doesn't get its own O oh, come and hear section. Uh, but it is kind of a corollary to O oh, come and bow down. Why? Because we can only listen, we can only hear if we are in subjection to him. If we are kneeling down before him, we accept his authority over us. And that's the only reason why we can listen. Why the, uh, That's the only reason why 
we should obey because God is over us. Because God has done everything for us so that we could come. And so out of that, out of that humility, out of that bowing down before God, there is also the willingness to listen. And so God calls us to listen in worship, to hear. Uh, but this hear is not, of course, the, the usual just, yes, I hear what you're saying, but I don't really hear what you're saying. Uh, it's not just listening with our ears, but it's hearing in terms of acting. How do we know this? Because it says, uh, when you're uh, do not harden your hearts. Right? That's the next, that's the 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 uh the complimentary verse if you hear his voice do not harden your hearts so you hear and then you do you don't do if your heart is hardened if say i'm not going to do that and that's the 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 story that he's pointing back to in exodus in exodus 17 there's a story of uh, Meribah and Masa, where God's people refuse to listen to God. It says they, uh, in fact, Meribah and Masa means to uh, uh, dissent and to, to test. And so they tested, verse 9, your fathers put me to the test. Uh, not like the kind of test that a teacher gives a student to see what they've learned, but a testing of, say, uh, a child of his or her parent, or a testing of authority, testing because you don't want to listen. Uh, back to our, our kind of illustration in the beginning of a child who always asks why, um, this kind of, of listening, listening, is like a child who says why to everything, not because they want to learn, but because they don't want to listen. And so they just tag a why onto everything, and that gets annoying very fast, as any parent will tell you. Here, the Israelites in the Old Testament, in, in Exodus, refuse to listen. It says, you put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. That is, they test God, in so that they refuse to believe God, they refuse to listen to God, even though they saw all of God's wondrous deeds. And even though they knew who this God was, even though they could see what he did, they refused to listen and obey him. So this, uh, this third point comes actually as a warning. Not usually what we think of when we think of worship, um, but we are, uh, we are warned that we need to hear God's voice and obey. Why? The why part is verse 10. For 40 years I load that generation and said, they are people who go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. They shall not enter my rest. In the story of Exodus, the, this, uh, this uh, encounter, this act of disobedience led to the people of God not being able to enter the promised land. That whole generation had to you know, do the Exodus again for 40 years until they all died out because none of that generation was allowed to enter into the promised land. And so literally... God said, you shall not enter my rest. That is, you shall not enter into the place that I have prepared for you, that place for you to settle, that place uh, that I've given you to be a home, that place of prosperity, that place of blessing. You will not enter into it because you were hard-hearted and you did not hear and obey. So, the danger is that, and this is why this is the third part of why uh, the elements we need to have in worship. 
All right, we need to sing, we need to bow down, but we also need to hear and obey. Why? Because if we do not listen, we will not enter God's rest. Why is that significant? What, another way of saying that is, not all those who sing worship songs are saved. Not all those who sing Amazing Grace will ever get to heaven. Not all those who sing It Is Well With My Soul will have their souls in heaven. Not all those that participate in worship will be with God in eternity. Not all those who are worship leaders will escape the fires of hell. Why? Because of this third necessary element of worship, obedience. If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. That is, obey. If you hear God speaking, you obey. This is uh, elaborated in Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, let's turn there really quick. Hebrews chapter 4. Actually starts in verse chapter 3. Uh, Hebrews quotes the psalm that we just read. It quotes Psalm 95. Right? In, verse five, in verse 7 of chapter 3. Therefore the Holy Spirit says, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said today, if you, enter, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom will he swear uh, that they would not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient? So we see that we are that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. And so uh, Hebrews kind of lays bare the root of what's going on in this passage. They didn't hear and obey. Why? Because they did not believe. They did not believe God. And so we are called to remember to, if we believe, that needs to be displayed. That needs to be uh, evidenced by how we live. It needs to be evidence that we hear and obey the word of God. So chapter four, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they did not, they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken on the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it. And those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterwards in the, the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would have spoken of another day later on. 
So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. This is a challenge for us as believers. That as we worship God, we need to worship him properly. Uh, And that means that we, our worship must consist of the things that we mentioned. Our worship must involve singing. And so if at home during this pandemic, you've gotten into the habit of not singing, stop it. Stop it and sing to God the praises due his name. We also need to bow down. We also need to humble ourselves. We need to realize worship is not a place that we belong as sinners. And so we need to be grateful. We need to be thankful for Jesus. And we need to submit ourselves to God in worship. Right? We need to, in worship, we offer ourselves. We offer our bodies. We offer our minds. We offer our hearts. That's why Paul says we we make ourselves a living sacrifice. Right? We offer our whole bodies before God. That is our spiritual act of worship, Romans 12. And then lastly, our worship must consist of hearing, that is, listening and obeying. Because if we do not obey, when we hear the word of God, we will not be in belief we will not enter into God's rest. No matter how many songs we sing, no matter how faithfully we attend church, it doesn't matter. Because true believers, true faith, is evidenced by a hearing and obeying of God's word. So hopefully God has spoken to you this morning through his psalm, through Psalm 95, he's spoken to you through his word. And And I just hope that if you hear God's word, anytime you hear God's word, whether it's right now, whether it's a future Sunday, whether it's, you know, from last week or in in your Bible reading during the week, if you hear God's word, do not harden your heart. Immediately put it into practice. Immediately listen and obey because that is worship as well. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you can call us to worship. That we can come because of the blood of Jesus. We can come despite being sinful people. We can come because you have paved a way through the blood of your Son. So, Lord, help us to worship you now as you have called us to worship. You have called us to come near to you. Lord, let us give to you the worship that is your due. That is the songs of our lips, the bowing down of our knees and of our hearts, and the obedience of our bodies. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.